Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. This is Jessup's Journal. Chris, great to see you. Doug, good to see you. Let's go chat. Chris, it's time to sign into Jessup's Journal. Thanks, Doug. Hi, this is Doug Jessup. In this episode of Jessup's Journal, I have Chris Dickinson with me. Thanks for having me, Doug. Oh, you betcha. So we are social distancing. We came and did the mask thing, but you know, we are now hand sanitizing, you know, with the folks from Five Wise Hand Sanitizer. Um, I actually have my own little brand, Jessup's Journal Hand Sanitizer, go figure. Um, and then I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a little dry mouth, you know, and so the guys at Spry hooking us up with some moisturizing Ooh, spray. Mm. And it tastes good too. First thing, people are gonna notice that uh, you and I happen to, uh, as Ed, my collaborator here says, we're wearing a lot of hat today. So um, I know you from JW Custom Hats. Uh, tell, tell me about your hat. So this hat was made by JW Custom Hats. Um, it's one that I put in my closet only for special occasions like being on Jessup's journey. <laughs> okay, well, um, this hat is called the Trail Boss. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a big ass hat and you know, and it's got the, he's got, it's called the Gus. Uh -huh. It's got the turkey feather, a little uh, amber from Lithuania. So, you know, we're, we're having some fun, but, um, you know, obviously you're kind of dressed a little Western here. So where did you grow up? I grew up actually in Montana. I was born up there and then I moved to Minnesota when I was about three years old. Uh, went to grade school and then moved back to Montana oh, okay. uh, in junior high and did part of, uh, did junior high and part of high school out in Montana and then did a couple years back in Minnesota as well. So Wow. Well, my grandmother actually was uh, raised, part of her childhood was in Minnesota. Okay. And I went back there and the one thing I noticed is there's lots of lakes and the humidity is a little different than Utah. So 10,000 lakes to be yeah, exact. Exactly. <laughs> on, I think it's on the license plates. I'm oh, you sure. betcha. <laughs> um, so I understand Montana. Yes. I get Minnesota. I get going back to Montana, but don't say plane, train or automobile. But how the heck did you get to Utah? My wife brought me to Utah. Oh, uh, right? it was a girl. It's, yeah, okay. it's yeah, always, yeah, 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 always. Yeah, same yeah. here, I'm just saying, you know. My wife is born and raised here in Utah. Oh, and okay. she brought me out here, yeah. Well, she brought me out here, but I willingly came out here for her. Well, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I'm, I met a girl, <laughs> you know, in college, and she was, you know, from, from Davis County, and I'm going, these, give you one guess where we've lived for a lot of years, so. The thing that people really know you, though, for is you are one heck of a, of a photographer. Thanks, Doug. How the heck did you get into that? So photography for me didn't start out like most people's um, journey does. Some people inherit cameras from you know aunts, uncles, dads, grandpas, something like that. Um, for me, it was out of necessity. It's something mm. that I that I always enjoyed, and I didn't appreciate that until I was much older. And looking back. My mom would take me, as a young boy in Minnesota, my mom would take me to the library. And, and I remember the library feeling so overwhelming. As a, as a small kid, it seemed, such, it seemed like such a big space. Mm -hmm. And she would put me down the, in the children's section and want me to read things like freckle juice or something like that. Go figure. Uh -huh. Well, from, from there, I would go up to the adult section and I would pick up magazines. I recall looking at uh, magazines like Life or National Geographic, periodicals like that. Mm -hmm. And the things that would strike me in, in those magazines was not necessarily the pictures per se, but once I would see the pictures, it was the, the feeling that came through those pictures. Um, for example, if I saw, I remember one picture in particular, probably over in Africa, and there were, there were some young, young kids, and they were on a gravel road, and behind them was a forest on fire. Mm. And what hit me was, I wonder what it feels like to stand on that gravel road, and I wonder what it smells like if I were standing there. Those are the things that would drive me on into my adult life, now, when my wife brought, you know, when my wife brought me out here, it almost sounds like she got me a bus ticket or something like that. But <laughs> when I came out here and uh, my, my wife and I were finally together, um, we ended up 
going self-employed. Uh, we started our own business, a dog training and photography business. And okay, hang on, hang on. Dog sure. training. Yes. And photography. Okay. Yeah. What? You're the you're the puppy photographer? Yeah. So that's how it started. <laughs> that's, really? That's honestly how it started. It sure did. Um, the way that the way that I looked at photography at that at that particular point in time in our business was this would just be it would just be a side hustle for me it wouldn't be more than that it mm -hmm. would just you know my wife would go out she would set up the training work with people in homes with their dogs i could bring them into the studio and from there we could just take their pictures develop some side income as a result of that yeah but what i quickly found out was as an opportunistic kind of person is that you can do more than that. And I also found that there was a much more creative journey in photography. That led to uh, getting into the Western world. And yeah, yeah, that's the, okay, here's the question. Yeah, when yeah. you were a puppy photographer, yeah. did and you? And I still am, don't get me wrong. Okay, there, okay. There's still a fair amount, yeah. When you started as a puppy uh -huh. photographer, yeah. did you have the awesome beard? No, I did not have the See, awesome beard. I'm not even beard. sure what you would look yeah. like uh -huh. Without the, how long have you had the beard? I've had the beard for just over two years, and it really? becomes yeah, it oh becomes a, it becomes a landmark. I guess yeah, like uh, you and hats. Yeah, I don't know what people would do with me without a beard. You know, it's funny. I've been in the newsroom occasionally, and there's new people, and sometimes I will forget my hat. Yeah. You know, and I've literally had people come up to say. Um, uh, sir, can I help you? Are you lost? <laughs> Going, you know, I've been here for over a decade. I'm pretty sure I know where I am. <laughs> How did you get into the Western world, though? That came through my wife. Oh, okay. So as, as a dog trainer, she also helped other, um, uh, other folks uh, raise, train, and sell their dogs. Mm -hmm. So there was one particular family out in Nevada that were trying to sell their Dobermans. And my wife had worked out a deal with them where she would bring the Dobermans in and she would help sell them here. She would put a base level of training on them and then turn around and, and sell them in the Utah market. Okay. One of the folks that, uh, that came down to buy one of the dogs was, was a cowboy and his wife. And he, uh, he saw my work and he invited me up to uh, some Western activity at the time. What I, didn't, what I didn't realize what we were doing is they were actually doing some processing, getting ready for fall shipping. And I went up there and photographed them doing what they do. Mm -hmm. From that point in time, um, after I released those images, then it was a process of a continual invite. It was that access to to that lifestyle. Um, what was more important to me, and again, you have that hindsight looking backwards. You you have the access to that world, but I think what's most important is you have the acceptance in that world as well. Yeah. So I developed a, a close network of folks that, without these individuals, without my wife, without um, these close folks that I've developed these relationships with. I certainly would not be where I'm at today. Well, you know, it's one of those things where it's kind of not necessarily who you are, it's who you know sometimes, you know, sure. that network thing. The thing that, so somebody's watching this and going, wow, I can take pictures, yep. you know? It's like, uh, yeah. Well, it's kind of like, you know, at the, at the TV station, we create a huge amount of, of video and everything, and we do a lot of story content, but we check things, and, you know, yeah. so yeah. just because you can doesn't mean you should is kind of one of the slogan lines we look at. How did you come to the realization that, okay, it started as a hobby. Was there a specific time where you said, this is what I'm doing? Oh, sure. Yeah. It, it was when Doug Jessup invited me to be on Jessup's journey. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've been doing this a lot longer than that. I have, yeah. My, my wife and I have been self-employed for uh, 13 years now. Wow. Um, Congrats. We, we have no, you know, I, I want people to know this, and I, and I tell people this all the time. There, we don't have a safety net. No. We, we don't. We wrestle that alligator every day for a living. I, I don't have a side job that I run off to, nor does she. We, we both do this for a living. At, let me kind of back up for a second, but mm -hmm. in, 
now, after we realized that you know the the photography was lucrative, you know before we were looking at it as just a side hustle, mm -hmm. uh, when we realized that you know what we can actually make you know a, a good revenue stream off of this, um, then we spun it off to its own business. So now, 100%, I am. Yeah, I am 100% photography, my wife is 100% dog training, but we both support each other and we both work literally back to back in the studio. Um, when did I know that it was more than just a hobby? Um, when I needed to make some money at it. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm yeah. not gonna sugarcoat it, yeah. but that was it. It wasn't um, something that, oh, you know, I always have a camera in my hand. It's not, it wasn't that. You, you said something that was curious in the, um, in the news world is, you know, just because you can shoot video doesn't mean that you should. And, and I would, the first thing that came to mind when you said that is, just because I put on a cowboy hat doesn't mean I'm a cowboy. And right. just because I have a camera in my hand doesn't necessarily mean I'm a photographer. I can take pictures, sure, but you know, I guess I would also add that in this day and age, especially right now, because you're adding content doesn't necessarily mean you're adding value. Yeah, and to you, what does value mean in, in the business for sure. you? Sure. Uh, value for me is finding that pain point for my clients, whether that's telling their story from a, from a family perspective, looking at it from the aspect of, you know, this is what Doug Jessup and his family look like. But you know what, let's break out of that posed, you know, element and let's get you in a natural environment and let's show what you, what you feel like, what your family looks like. This is what you look like, this is what you feel like. And that's why that's the way I approach, even with my commercial clients um, like AQHA or um, Western Horseman or AQHA Journal or you know any of these folks that I've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way that I approach it. It's who you are and and what you look like. Now you have a slogan line that is kind of similar to mine. I'm a storyteller. Yes. Okay, and you know I yes I've interviewed lots of people, but it's that it's that almost that sense of smell of vision you know, that you can put together and you can, you can hear the crunch of the gravel, you know, yeah. or the yeah. snort of the animal, you know, there in, or in the, the rodeo. Or the smell of the animal. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my slogan line is, stories have power. Yes. They help us understand each other. And you've got a slogan line that uh, just happens to be on this journal right here that, that, uh, that Rustico made for you. Thank you. And so you want to tell us what your slogan line is on there? Sure. It's not just a snapshot, it's a story. Fill me in on that. Sure. I think it was about five or six years ago. Uh, somebody asked me, they, somebody asked me a question. I was being interviewed and they said, do you feel like you've made it? And, yeah. and to be honest with you, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I know what comes to mind when somebody says something like that to me. And, and that is, there's a picture of a young boy. He's probably no more than four years old, maybe five. And he's being chased by his great grandpa with a branding iron. Oh my. His heels are roped by his grandpa who's horseback and his mom and dad are standing over by um, his grandpa and everybody's laughing. Now, in 30 years from now, I would suspect that this child would look back on this image and remember that. Um, people aren't around forever. We, we wake up from that dream of immortality and we realize that we have a finite number of days on this earth. And if we can, if we can capture in an image the story of what it felt like to be somewhere, what it feels like to put mouth spray in your mouth. Incidentally, that went more over my beard than in my mouth. But <laughs> well, you could yeah. practice yeah, later, yeah. you know? Um, if we can capture in an image a story of a family, Mm -hmm. That's what I'm after, and, and that's where it's not just a snapshot, it's a story. Well, you know, because the thing that I look at is you look at some of the older pictures and, you know, that, that you've got, and usually they're, I mean, let's get real, you know, the ones you have in the genealogy book and everything, they're old farts, and it's just like, and, and they got a sour look because they probably had to wait, you know, and keep an image there for 15 minutes uh -huh. or something. There's one picture of my grandparents that mm. I just love. Mm -hmm. And it's them in a photo booth and when they were dating, you know, it's just like, okay. And it, it makes them more real. 
I guess, you know? It's interesting you bring that up because for me, um, by the time I was born, I didn't have any grandparents. I've never had any, I've never had any great grandparents. Heck, I've never even, I've never even known an aunt or an uncle. I had a great aunt uh, who, who died when I was in my teens and that was the only real piece of tangible history that, or, or link to any tangible history that I had. Recently though, my mom um, invited me over last year and, and she wanted to give me a family heirloom, which is pretty rare because we don't have a lot. Yeah. In fact, we have nothing for family heirlooms. Mm -hmm. It's a picture of a, it's a buckskin coat and it was made back in the early 1900s, perhaps late 1800s. On the back of it are brands from ranches. And in the middle of it is my great grandpa and there's a cow and it's my great grandpa's brand and it's my great uncle's brand. The reason I bring that up is because my, my great grandpa started the Great Falls Meat Company back in the late 1800s. He would go out and he would purchase cattle from the local ranches around Great Falls, Montana. The brands on the back of that buckskin coat are from those ranches. And that is a piece of tangible, in fact, it's the only piece of tangible history of family history that I have. So when you hold that, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at those brands, yeah. you smell that leather. Yeah. What's the, as you put it, what's the emotion that you feel? Uh, you definitely feel a direct link to your past that mm -hmm. to some degree, although I'm not, I, w I would never consider myself a cowboy. I'm certainly not a rancher and I don't tend cattle every day. I have dear friends that, that do that, that mm -hmm. are true, in my opinion, true cowboys. Um, but it gives me a direct link to the past and, yeah. it, and it certainly makes me feel like this actually ran through my blood and probably still does. You've told lots of different stories over your career. Is there any particular one that just says, okay, you know, if, I, if you had the book and this is, this is the body of my work after mm -hmm. I've done things, what's, what's some of the top projects that you've done that you will always remember or that have special meaning to you? You, you ask that question and my mind immediately goes to one certain place. Um, and, and I think I have to give you a little bit of background. Um, a, a huge inspiration for me is, you know, as you pick up a camera and you, and you begin that, that photographic journey, you, mm -hmm. you learn about lighting, posing, composition, you yep. know, all, all this stuff. Yeah. That, that is just the icing. That is the icing on the cake. That's the fun stuff that we get to learn. The, the deeper creative mm -hmm. um, journey is a challenge that you'll never, it, it, for me, it's a, it's a challenge that will never be conquered. It's something that you continually work, work on, work towards to that end. I just finished a book by a photographer who was deeply inspirational to me coming up through the ranks. His name was Robert Kappa. He was a conflict photographer back in oh, the, you know, World War II. Oh, wow. um, uh, in, he said something, he said, if your picture isn't good enough, you're not close enough. And it's something that I've always kept in mind mm. when I'm out on location. I get out there, I'm certainly not afraid to be out in the middle of the branding pen, assuming they let me there, um, which I, I tend to be there quite often. Mm -hmm. That does come with its own risks and challenges. I've been run over, I've been mucked out. Um, but to be honest with you, Doug, there's a, there's a feeling, there's a rush that I get when that happens. When, when we talk about um, stories, we, you talk about those one particular moments, um, mm -hmm. the, that book, you know, in, in your journal, if you're writing out. Maybe some people talk more about the fun stuff. I talk about the emotional connection that our totally images agree. have. Totally agree. And, and it, comes from, it comes from a woman who, who asked me to photograph her son to ask me a f to photograph a picture of her son. Hmm. And I did the same thing. I said, well, that's interesting. And she said, um, yep, um, that's my son. And he took his own life when he was 10. And, wow. and I said, you know, I, I would be more than honored to, to do that for you. So I went down to a restaurant. My wife came with me. 
and she um, she proceeded to to hand me the the boots that her boy was wearing and and the hat that he was wearing on the day that he took his own life. They're Native American. There was a feather in in the hat that's blessed, and as she passed it over to me, she said, "You know, make sure that this feather doesn't touch the ground." I said, "Absolutely." In addition to that, she said, "I want you to photograph that picture and his boots and his hat on this table where my grandma used to sit, and her initials are right here." And and then I want you to include this picture of my dad and my sister who have passed on. And then I want you to include this painting of the church and the graveyard where everybody is buried. And so I did, and it took, um, it took a couple hours. Um, I indivi you know, from the technical side of things, I individually lit the images mm -hmm. and, and then um, just did a huge composite of right. everything. The last thing that I did, though, was I asked, I asked this gal, I said, I need you to hold the picture of your son like this. And now she's, she's a person that is, doesn't want to be in the camera. Right. Yeah, bless her, bless her heart. I had her hold the, the picture like this because as a parent, you'll never, you'll never forget the feeling of holding your child. Yeah. And, um, and that was the last thing that I did. And I, I pulled in just some faint fingers of her holding that picture of her son. Now, I finished the picture up and I sent it to her and she was ecstatic. And unbeknownst to her, I sent her a print of this, of this image. It arrived on the anniversary of her son's death. Ooh, wow. To which she, she was beyond worth. Uh, everything was out of love in this image. And, um, and after it was over, um, to be honest with you, Doug, I wanted to throw my equipment away. I didn't want to. I didn't want to shoot anymore. I told my wife that I'm almost. I'm done. I'm done with this, and um, it put me in therapy um, because I be didn't. What was it? Was it because you had reached the pinnacle, or because it was a PTSD mm, thing, or what? Uh, sometimes I believe that as, um, as I say, photojournalist, as as a person that goes out and documents stories that embeds themselves um, so emotionally with. Mm -hmm. Um, with troops, with individuals, with families, and sometimes it's hard to come back from that. I don't hide at all the fact that uh, we need to take care of ourselves as photographers. You know, some people can go out there and they'll just take snapshots and hey, that's cool, no problem. Um, I go much deeper than that and, and I really try and absorb myself into their stories. And I believe that's why I'm, I'm hired for many of the jobs that, that I go on. Um, in this particular case, uh, it was very hard to come back from that. I didn't have um, the emotional tools to deal with the aftermath of that. And it mm -hmm. certainly, it wasn't even my child. Um, and I needed to learn how to, how to let go of some of these things. So. It reminds me, um, I did an interview with Marcos Ortiz. He's our crime reporter at the station. And I mean, he's, he's had the rare occurrence, I guess is the best way to put it, of being a witness at two different death penalty executions. The last one that was done by firing squad and one of the first that was done by lethal injection. You know, and then um, I believe I'm, I'm the only reporter that's been allowed to do an interview inside the women's prison. And I had the exact same experience you did. I had to go chat with, with Marcos and say, I'm having a, a kind of a hard time processing because admittedly, they told me, okay, you're not allowed to ask why these people are here. Well, I, got, I, I did after the fact. I'm going, oh, okay, that was interesting. But then you, you counter it. There's an interview that I just did recently and I don't know why, but it was, I just had such a connection with this woman because my grandmother died when my mom was 14, so I never met her. I had the honor of interviewing a 103-year-old woman by the name of Romaine. A month later, she had a fall, and she passed away three days later. And so I went to to the, the, the service and I met with the family and they hugged me 
mm -hmm. and said, you don't know how valuable, how important this interview you did with our mother, with our grandmother, with our great-grandmother was. <clears throat> and I got to say, that's going to be one of those things I remember for my entire career. You know, because that, that special, that emotion, that power. Um, switching gears from a different emotion. There's one picture that you took, and I'm just going, okay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of Mad Max-ish or something. I don't know. I'm <laughs> going, how in the world did Chris do this? And where in the world were you technically standing? But there's this picture. There's this horse. Okay, and that's the dust and the, you can just feel the grime going. And then there's this guy and he's just, you know, riding a metal horse and it looks like the metal horse from hell, you know, and it's just like whoosh. What in the world was the setting for that? Okay, so it's for a company called Black Bear Brand. I'm actually wearing their coat right now. Oh, okay. He said, you know, I really, I really want to get a picture of myself on my 37, you know, Harley. Serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that is so cool. Um, yeah, he, he drives around with with an old chopper and this old uh, 37 pan head. He said, I, I really want to get a picture of, of me and a, me riding my motorcycle and a horse and, and I want a dusty road. I said, count me in, you know, this ironically, is a creative pursuit that I've looked for for about a decade. It's a, sometimes we get pictures in our head that, we, that I, I do anyways, I, that I can't get rid of, and I need, I, I need an outlet for those. Well, this is something that I've been visualizing for a decade. Um, it all came together on one evening with a dear friend of ours. Uh, her name is Waylon Lucas. She's a celebrity pastry chef on the Food Network's Cake Wars. Um, she has her horse and Josh has his motorcycle and they said yeah we want a gravel road and want a sunset yada 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 okay well you know when you take your experience you go well we're gonna go out to the West Desert in fact we're gonna go out to Lone Rock so you have you have Tooele and mm -hmm. then you go to Skull Valley right is the next valley and Lone Rock is about five miles south mm -hmm. after you turn off so we went out there. We had about an hour of light left. Um, I, you know, I need that low. I need that low sun. You know, just mm -hmm. backlight that oh, dust yeah. as, it, as it's coming up, and and hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers that the roads are fairly decent enough that you know nobody's going to get thrown from their horse and <laughs> yeah. everybody's going to stay put. Um, they came down the road in the road that I chose in the beginning and it wasn't it wasn't good okay. um, there's too much distraction so I was like, okay we got to go over the hill and we don't have much time we have five maybe ten minutes left so we got to mm -hmm. make this happen now I said do you see this road coming around like this and they said yeah I said that's where I need you to be I'm gonna be elevated shooting down on you like this that's how you did it yeah. so you okay because I was trying to so they were yeah. they were at a much lower elevation where in, in retrospect, everything that I do, in fact, a majority of the work that I do is from a very low perspective, mm -hmm. shooting up and, you know, literally, I want them coming yeah. by me, you know, right. three feet away from me. This one was much different. I had to get, I had to get an elevated position and get them coming around. Because I originally them. thought, I'm going, geez, you're getting a helicopter or something? I don't know yeah. how you got that shot, but yeah. phenomenal shot. Thank you. Look, everything that I have photographed, every person, every horse, every motorcycle, every event, whatever it is. I can't, and I'll look straight at the camera, I cannot do what I do without people letting me do that, without True. people trusting me to, to execute. Well, Chris, one of the things that I look at is that you and I are kind of in the same business. We're both storytellers, and sometimes stories should, you know, they have to be written down, be it, you know, in a journal, be it on film or in, in video or whatever. Those things have to be written down, they have to be, to be able to be remembered. Yeah, I agree. And the thing I look at is when we're doing those stories, we're, we're making marks. We're making marks on the paper, we're making marks in people's minds, in their memories. The folks at Rustico have a, a little hashtag that I like to ask everybody. So uh, I, I do get a little bit more official, you know, broadcasting wise. <clears throat> okay, here, let's, let's get the, uh, the mouth spray. Mr. Chris Dickinson, how do you want to leave your mark? Uh, leaving somebody's mark, 
I, I feel like is more than, more than just putting a slogan down on a piece of leather or writing the story. I believe that if you want your mark to last, and I think back to this, uh, uh, this buckskin coat where my great grandpa has his, has his brand. I want to think even longer term than that. Yeah, his mark is left on there, but uh, I believe that a mark that is sustainable is inspiration that you leave in somebody else. And if I can inspire someone um, to pursue the creative art of photography, and if I can inspire someone to, to go out and tell stories of others, I believe that I've left my mark. Well said. Thanks again for coming on Jessup's Journal. Thank you for having me, Don. Oh, not a problem. Um, this is the thing I want people to remember is the people that help, you know, make this all possible. So usually I wait till the end to say it, but I'm going to say him now. Okay, that guy right over there. Hi, Ed. Ed is the guy that makes us look good and, and sound good, I, I might say. He's my collaborator. He's been my photographer for, for, for years. So uh, he, he, he's going to appreciate what you do. The other thing, of course, is the folks at Five Wise with the uh, the hand sanitizer and, uh, may I say, adult beverages. Yeah, uh, got, got one there for you. And then, of course, Taylor Cooperative always makes me look good. And JW Custom Hats made us both look good, I'm just saying. And then, of course, people remember to clean their hands. And this sounds goofy as all get out, but totally serious, you know. Don't forget, clean your nose. So that's the folks at Clear. Here's the thing I want people to remember. That's, that's you people right out there. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry in a Jessup's Journal and Chris Dickinson, I'm Doug Jessup, ABC4 News.